Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who died and lived again. I know your troubles. I know that you are poor, but really you are rich. That's what we just sang about, by the way. I know the evil things said against you by those who claim to be Jews, but are not. They are a group that belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of anything you are about to suffer. Okay. Listen. Listen. The devil will put you to the test. Hmm. By having some of you thrown into prison, and uh, your troubles will last ten days. Be faithful to me, even if it means death, and I will give you life as your prize of victory. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who win the victory will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, have your way. Accomplish your purpose. Most of us think we're here for one reason or another. You have a purpose for each one of us being here this morning. Each of us has needs. This preacher can't speak to each one and their needs. But your spirit can. And your word can. Your word anointed by your spirit your presence in this service. You can speak to each one of us right where we are according to our need. And we pray that it might be done in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I was <clears throat> blown away this morning as... Uh, we were going through the music in realization of how the music picked out by Pastor Rob weeks ago fits the message that I finally zeroed in on in the middle of the night last night. I uh, had a hard long day yesterday and uh, went to bed late last night and Snoopy, our dog, Excuse me. Snoopy. Karen's dog. <laughs> Started barking at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he was a little insistent about it. And so I got up and I went through the whole house and checked everything and everybody to make sure that we were all okay and everything was fine. So I went back to bed. Snoopy decided instead of laying down on her side of the room, lays down on my side of the room. So that at 3.30, quarter to four, he starts barking again. And I got up and I went through the house again. And I'm looking out all the windows and trying to figure out what in the world is going on. So finally I went... Karen doesn't know this, but Karen, I, I finally, I went to my office and turned on the light and said, okay, Lord, which message is it? Because there were a couple of messages in my mind, whether it's going to be Pergamos or Smyrna. And I had told folks it was going to be Smyrna, but then I was feeling like it should be Pergamos for some reason. And so I sat there and read and studied for a little bit and decided, okay, the Lord's leaving Smyrna. And then I come this morning, and the music that we've sung, I, maybe you'll associate it, maybe not, but it 
fits. The third verse of Count Your Many Blessings, I told the praise team, I've never sung that verse before. Never. I don't ever remember seeing that verse to count your many blessings. But it fits the message this morning. Okay? And then some of the songs we're singing later fit the message. Picked out weeks ago. The Holy Spirit leads that way. Yes? I also believe He prepares your hearts that way. According to your need. According to whatever it might be. I mean, it's such a blessing to stand up there and be leading the music of, uh, what was the first song we sang? Hmm? Great and mighty. Great and mighty. Thank you. I was hoping somebody over here would remember what it was, but I obviously, okay. Great and mighty. We're singing great and mighty, and Tanya comes in, and she's back there clapping her hands and singing away. That's a, that's a rich, rich blessing. Praise the Lord. Smyrna. Church at Smyrna. You know, you know that there, in Scripture there are, a lot of Scripture is, is like a paradox. Where you say one thing and then it seems as if you're saying just the opposite. Yes? You know what a paradox is? Yes? And for instance, if you go through the blessed of the Sermon on the Mount, there's a lot of paradoxes in those Blessed, but underneath is a tremendous scriptural principle. Okay, and 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 here with the church at Smyrna, here here is this church. It's a Smyrna is a wonderful, great big city and and a rich city and and really nice. And they got these huge temples that the people worship in, and and Roman government has freedom of worship for most people. And it just is a great place. And Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, I know you're poor. First of all, he says, I know you. I know what you're going through. You get that? Do you understand this morning, no matter what your week has been, no matter what your morning has been, Jesus knows you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through if you're going through something. He knows what you've been through. He knows the baggage you brought to this service that you brushed off at the beginning. He's here. The book of Revelation is a book about Jesus. The focus of the book of Revelation is Jesus. Jesus is at the center of the book of Revelation, in spite of what man has made out of it. Okay? Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the messenger. Jesus is the one who is walking these aisles even at this moment. Whether you're paying attention or not, he knows. Okay? Even if you have a look on your face to encourage the preacher that you are paying attention, he knows whether you are or whether you aren't. Okay? <laughs> He knows the focus of the book of Revelation is Jesus. And the message of the book of Revelation was to encourage believers. Not discourage them from reading it, okay? It was to encourage believers in the first century church. In the church from the very beginning all the way through as I shared last week. It was to encourage believers. Believers, it is to encourage believers. That's number one, number two. And it was written to the churches. Okay? It was written to the churches at that time. It's written to the churches in every age. We've been sharing that over and over again on Wednesday nights in our study. But it's written to the churches in every age. So the book of Revelation is valid for us today. Every page of it. Every word of it. Jesus is the focus. It's to encourage believers. Whatever they're going through. Whatever they're experiencing. Whatever they are about to go through. Or experience. It is to encourage them. And it's written to churches. To congregations. It was shared in their services. It should be shared in our services. To give a, a word of encouragement. So there's the three points. I guess we can go home. 
No, Ron. <laughs> All right. So here's the church of Smyrna. Hmm. Poor people. They were poor. They faced some rough times. Some of them at one point had been pretty well off. But because they became believers, they lost their businesses. They lost their standing in their communities. They were looked down upon because they were believers. And so they became poor financially. How would you handle that? And yet he says, they're rich. I'm reminded of Peter and John uh, after Jesus had resurrected and after they had witnessed him going back to heaven. And they're still going to the temple to pray. Imagine that. Okay? They're headed up to the temple to pray. And as they're headed in this one particular afternoon for the afternoon prayer time, there's this guy sitting there who has been paralyzed for a very, very long time, probably all of his life, and he's begging for alms because he knows that as the people go in, you know, hey, we want to hear from God, we want a blessing from God, so in order to get a blessing from God, we'll buy it. Hopefully that's not their attitude, but... Unfortunately, for some folk, it is. And so he was asking for money. And Peter says to him, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And, and there is this feeling here that he's reaching, as the guy is reaching up, Peter's reaching down and taking a hold of his hand, and the guy, the strength comes into his legs and into his body, and pretty soon he's jumping up and down, praising the Lord. Silver and gold have I none, poor, but such as I have in the name of Jesus, rich. And that guy is set free, physically, spiritually, at every level of his being. Set free. A few years ago, there was a group taking a tour of the church in Rome. And the tour guide was showing them all of the fancy buildings and the gold and the silver and uh, the famous paintings by Michelangelo and, and all this beautiful facility. And, and the tour guide says to the group, no longer can the church say, silver and gold have I none. And from back of the tour group, there was a guy who says, and no longer can the church say, rise up in the name of of Jesus. What are we rich in? What are we poor in? As a congregation? As individuals? As men in our families? What is our focus? Where are we? Rich. Poor. I speak this as to the church, but I also speak it to the men this morning. Since it's Father's Day, you take an, an extra ounce out of it, okay? In order for us to be what God would have us to be, to be rich in the things of God, to be rich in our personal lives, to be rich in our families, I'm going to submit to you there's a minimum of three things, actually two things. The third one is a reward, but three things. So here's that three-point message. Number one, conviction. We must be people 
of convictions. What is a conviction? A conviction is not an opinion. Get that. A conviction is not an opinion. A conviction is a principle that we would be willing to die to defend. That is a conviction. And in order for the church to be rich in the things of God, in order for our families to be rich in our relationships with one another and within the world around us, in order for us to be rich, we must be people of convictions. And I submit convictions based on the Word of God. There are basic convictions we can't compromise on, church. There are basic convictions that we as, as, as the men of our families, as the leaders, the spiritual leaders of our families, that we can't compromise on. There's a basic conviction in our relationship with God. There is only one way to have a relationship with God, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is my conviction. In order to know God, I must receive, accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary for me and humble myself to acknowledge my sin, my shortcomings, my inability to even begin to have a relationship with God. But Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross of Calvary so that I can have that relationship. So I can know God. So I can have purpose and meaning in this life now. That's a conviction that I should be willing to give my life for to defend. It's a conviction that holds me, drives me, directs me, and it costs something for me to have that. I was thinking about, you know, last week we, I, I shared with you, I started to say we, I shared with you about the, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down and how, in my opinion, it's present here now. And we can enter in. Okay? And the river is flowing now. And the tree of life is available now to us. It, as we were reading that, you remember the pearly gates? There's a description of the gates that into the city. And they're called gates of pearl. It's kind of strange, isn't it? Have a gate of pearl. Anybody? Listen, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I grew up in the state of Delaware. My folks had a place down on the bay, and so we spent time fishing. I didn't catch much, but we spent time fishing. We spent time hunting for clams. And occasionally, we'd find an oyster. Now, the only reason to open up the oyster, as far as we were concerned, was to see if there was a pearl inside there. And why? Why? Because a pearl's worth a lot of money, right? You know how that pearl got started, got made? We never found one. You know how it got made? Because the oyster was agitated with a piece of dirt. Now, wait a minute. Pearly gate? Gate of pearl? It, it, it caused that oyster trouble. It caused that oyster pain to have that piece of dirt in there. And so it would keep coating it and coating it and coating it until finally the dirt was completely hidden inside that pearl of great price. In order to enter the kingdom, you must come through the pearl of great price. Jesus Christ paid a tremendous price on the cross of Calvary for you. Remember the story he told of the, of the pearl? Huh? And everybody selling everything in order to get that pearl of great price? Jesus is that pearl. He 
is the entrance into the kingdom. That's a conviction that we must hold and we must lift up and we must challenge folk. Look, if you don't receive Christ as your Savior, you're headed in the wrong direction in this life. You're going to experience hell in this life and you're going to experience it for all eternity. That's a conviction. And we can't compromise on that. And there are other convictions. I won't go into all of them, but there are other convictions. There is black and white, folks. There is right and wrong. And this world is full of too much compromise, which causes us to be poor in our relationship with God, in our relationship with each other, with the world around us. Conviction. Consistency. Number two. Consistency. You want to be rich in your relationship with God? Then be consistent in your life in applying the principles of His Word. Consistent. And we could... We could go down a long list, you know, of inconsistencies. But, but probably, probably the, the one I want to stay away from, but that I have to deal with, is in your mouth. <laughs> Not mine. Yeah, stick out your tongue. <laughs> Tracy. <laughs> It's our tongue. It's our tongue. We talk about loving God. We talk about His love in our lives, in our hearts. We talk about His love. We gather here together on Sunday morning and we talk with each other in a loving, caring way. I hope. In a loving, caring way, and, and before we're out the door, we're talking about how bad the preacher preached, or how bad the music was, or why they sing those stinking old hymns again, because that stinking old preacher was leading them. <laughs> and we laugh at that, but it's not funny. Not really. Because all we're doing is is increasing the negativity of the lives of those around us as well as ourselves. We're losing the richness of our relationship with God when we talk that way. When we talk, are we consistent concerning our relationship with God and our relationship with each other? Consistency. Preacher was trying to help his kid understand about the Holy Spirit. And he was telling his kid about how the Holy Spirit comes in and lives within us and enables us to do what enables us to be consistent. Yes? In our spiritual walk. Enables us to be consistent. And the kid wasn't getting it. And the kid was asking, what does it mean that the Holy Spirit comes in and, and, and helps me to, with what comes out? And so the preacher thought for a little bit. And finally he took his kid and he said, come on. And they go in the bathroom. Okay? And the preacher pulls out a tube of toothpaste. And he takes the lid off. And he puts the tube of toothpaste on the floor. And he tells his kid, jump on it. <laughs> He's a crazy preacher, all right? He tells his kid, jump on it. He jumps on it with all the enthusiasm that a kid would do, right? And out squishes the toothpaste. And... Kids looking at his dad like, okay, who's going to clean up this mess? All right. And preacher says, jump on it again. 
And he jumps on it again. And the preacher says, that's what having the Holy Spirit in you is all about. When you get squeezed, what's on the inside comes out. How consistent are you? When you get jumped on, what's on the inside comes out. Yeah? When negative things are said about you, what's on the inside comes out. What's on the inside? How consistent are you in your relationship with the Lord? Rich or poor? Convictions, consistency. And if you have those convictions based on the principles of God's word, if you have that consistency that is supplied by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit as you yield to him in your daily, moment-by-moment -moment life, then the scripture says you will possess a crown. Now, everybody thinks that crown is in heaven. And it is. But I submit to you, that crown is right here. Right now. When our life is based upon the convictions of God's word, and we are consistent in the application of that word in this life, we possess a crown. Not where we rule over people, but where people are sensitive to the difference, the change, the richness of what really matters in life. 